Well, as you're receiving the offering, I'd love for you to turn to Acts chapter 17. We've been walking through the book of Acts, and so many unique things happened in the early church. And in Acts 17, we're going to see two different responses to truth. And you may be amazed to find out that these responses are not new. It's not just in 2024 that people respond to truth this way. It has been throughout the history of mankind that when truth is presented, there are two avenues in which human beings respond. Now, why would we teach this? Why is this an important thing? Because it can be very discouraging if you think that this is the first time in human history that humanity has rejected truth. If you think, oh man, no generation before us has ever dealt with people that don't want to hear truth, has never dealt with emotional responses instead of actual communication and conversation, it's never happened before, it can be very discouraging. But how about if we understood this has actually happened throughout human history, time and time and time again, and it will continue to happen as long as mankind has their minds blinded by sin. But as we study Acts 17, there's two different ways I want us to see this. One is to prepare us in how to deal with the world when truth is communicated to the world so that we're not surprised and that we're not discouraged with the world's response. But the second way I want you to think about this passage is how do you respond to truth? You see, the truth that we as followers of Christ respond to is very different. If you've already called upon the name of the Lord, you've responded to the greatest truth that there is, that God loves you, that he sent his son to die for you, and that by faith in him, you can have eternal life. Responding to that truth is the beginning of a Christian journey. And for the rest of your time on this earth, what God is going to do is reveal another level of truth to you. Reveal something greater to you. He's going to call you to greater holiness. He's going to call you, call you to greater discipline. He is going to slowly take you from where you are today to where he wants you to be. And that's a refining process that happens over time. You see, you don't come to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, forgive me my sins, and boom, have no issues or problems or never sin again or never think wrong again or never make mistakes again. What we do is we come before the Lord, and the Bible says we're literally born as babies into a spiritual kingdom, and we grow from there. But on our individual journeys, as truth is revealed, I want you to know there's still two responses to truth. And sometimes we can find ourselves, even the family of God, wrestling with how to respond with the truth God is revealing today. Why? Because, God, you weren't asking me to do this a year ago. God, a year ago, I didn't feel convicted about this. I didn't see this as something that I needed to do. Lord, a year ago, you weren't asking this of me. And God's like, I know. But a year ago, you were younger and you were in a different season. And I'm guiding you somewhere. I have a plan for you. I have a plan for your family. I have a plan for this community. And in my plan, I need you to grow and I need you to mature. And I need you to look more like Jesus Christ than you do today. And it's a beautiful thing, but it's humbling. It's humbling because all of us have to admit that we're not there yet. That there's more Christ-likeness that could be formed in me. There are rough areas of my life, areas of my heart, ways that I think, emotions that I feel that don't fully look like Jesus yet, but I want them to. And even in that state, when we're not perfect, we're not yet completely Christ-like, did you know God wants to use you? God's given you gifts, talents, passions, unique experiences, and he says, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus done, you are qualified to be my hands and feet. You're qualified to represent me because of the Spirit of God that lives in you. So there's two different ways I want us to look at this. Again, one is how we're doing with the world. The other is how this impacts us individually. But before we jump into Acts chapter 17, I really want us to just have a foundational understanding of something. And this foundational understanding comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I'm going to read it real quick. We're not going to spend too much time here, but I want us to be on the same biblical page when it comes to this idea that this is not new. Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 11 says this, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. 
What profit has a man for all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers came, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. One of the enemy's greatest lies is that somehow this is brand new, never thought of before, never seen before. It's just not true. What am I talking about? I'm talking about our culture. I'm talking about the, the movements happening within America right now. I'm talking about even things happening that are battling the church. It's not new. There's nothing new under the sun. Keep reading. Verse 10 it says, is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. You know, historians will often say that those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. Have you heard that before? The same is true with the cultural flow of humanity. You can go back and begin to study from the earliest of times and you will see every movement that is happening right now has happened before. There have been other sexual revolutions. There have been other anti-God movements. There have been other revivals and moves toward God. It's not new. There is a perpetual cycle. And Ian, it's really discouraging if we don't know that God has overcome these things generation after generation after generation. I'm not a doomsayer. I look at this world and I say, yeah, it's dark. Trust me. Look at history. It has been darker. And Jesus has overcome greater odds than even this. There is hope for our nation, not because of how great we are, but because his is the name above all names, because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords, and he guides his people not away from difficult things, but through difficult things into victory. Study it out. The world has constantly tried to silence truth. Constantly. It rails against truth. Humanity has constantly travailed against its own pride and selfishness. Ever since the fall, it's something we wrestle with. I wrestle with it. I wrestle with my pride. I wrestle with my selfishness. And I am in desperate need of the Holy Spirit today to help me overcome. That is not a new position or place to be as a follower of Christ. It has been and it will be. We must understand this. Because the enemy, again, loves to convince you it's never happened before, which means God has no idea how to overcome it. Right? Isn't that the lie? Oh, man, this is so new. It's so scary. There's no hope. I'm telling you, there is hope, and his name is Jesus Christ. So with that foundation, let's understand, there's nothing new under the sun. Let's jump into Acts 17. All right, Acts 16, we see Paul and Silas begin the second missionary journey, and uh, a lot of uh, stuff has happened to them along the way. And now in Acts 17, it says, Now when they, again, Paul and Silas and their team, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as was his custom, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from Scriptures. This was Paul's habit. God would call him into an area. Remember the Macedonian call? Now he's beginning to enter into Macedonia and to do what God's called him to do. And this was his pattern. I'm going to show up to a place. I'm going to find my Jewish brothers and sisters. And I'm going to start right there. For three Sabbaths, three weeks, he presented the gospel of Jesus Christ using the scriptures. So yes, you can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. You can. It's a great study. If you don't know how to do it, oh my goodness, this is an amazing study. How can I communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament? See, because God was revealing his plan to mankind the whole time. Then it says in verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had suffered and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Again, if you were a Jew, you understood 
that you were anticipating the coming of the Christ, the anointed one of God who would fulfill the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were anxiously waiting. The problem is, is sometimes we get our eyes on the physical, not the spiritual, because many, many, many Jews wanted the physical kingdom to come. They wanted physical comfort rather than a spiritual kingdom that would bring them spiritual peace. So we see here, he's communicating clearly three weeks in a row, having these conversations, verse 4. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of devout Greeks, and not a few leading women joined Paul and Silas. So of the Jews he was talking to, a small group was persuaded. But the Greeks around him? My goodness, it says a large number, a multitude came and responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious and took some evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, setting all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Verse 6. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. I don't think they realized what a compliment that was to Paul and Silas and their team. Keep reading, verse 7. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decree of Caesar, saying, there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowds and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures. Say, search the scriptures. Say it again, search the scriptures. This is so important. We're going to see how this is one of the key reasons of how we can respond differently. They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. And also not a few Greeks, prominent women as well as men. Oh, and the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word was of God was preached by Paul at Berea. They came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Paul and sorry, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Same team. Same message. Two different groups of what should have been similar people. Paul went to his Jewish brothers and sisters first, right? But the first response we see in the people of Thessalonica. This was the first response. How did the people of Thessalonica respond? Well, go back to Acts 17. We just read it. Verse 5 says, But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious. Envy is an emotion. And you see, they were not persuaded, but apparently neither could they refute his arguments. You see, if they could stand there toe-to-toe with Paul and refute his arguments, I think they would have been okay. You ever do that? You ever, you ever get into an argument that you know you're going to win? Like, for example, Dr. Pepper is the best soda ever made. There's no way you can win this argument. It is just true. Oh, wait, that's called opinion. Right? Sometimes if an argument's opinion, you can't really argue. But when there is absolute truth, you can't argue against truth. So what do they do? Instead of engaging in the conversation and a discovery of truth, they gave into their emotions. They began to let their emotions rule their decisions. They became offended at the truth. And then what did they do to silence truth? They took some evil men from the market and they gathered a mob. Wait, wait, a mob? You mean people have used violence and mobs and riots and groups and threats to silence truth before? I thought this was brand new. No, 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 no. It is mankind's response to truth. If, they don't, if mankind doesn't want to yield to truth, mankind will rail against the truth. And these railings are emotionally driven. These railings are not logical. They are not calmly communicated, and it is through threats and through violence the truth is attempted to be suppressed. 
Anytime I'm dealing with, with a couple, I've done a lot of marriage counseling. And uh, anybody know how to fight well with their wife? You know this? You can have great fights. You can have wonderful fights with your wife where the two of you come out of that fight in unity together. Where the two of you come out actually having made a decision, learning more about one another, growing closer together through the conflict. Did you know that's called healthy conflict resolution? That can happen in the marriage. Matter of fact, when I'm doing premarital counseling, I pray much healthy conflict over every couple. Because it is through conflict you're going to grow together. It's through conflict you're going to smooth each other out. It's through conflict you actually come into unity. But as I'm sitting there with a couple, as soon as emotions begin to get high, I have to stop the conversation. Hold on, guys. Emotions have now taken over this conversation. This is no longer a healthy conflict because emotions are now ruling the words that you're saying. Emotions are now the filter through which you're hearing. So pause. As soon as an accusation or a name is called, I pause it. I'm like a referee. Time out. You, you, you just called her a name or him a name. You have now disengaged from healthy conflict resolution. And you are now engaging in avoidance of dealing with the issue. And we're seeing this happen in our political world. Names are being called as if a name is enough to silence truth rather than actual conversation that leads to truth. I've been watching this with bated breath in our community, in our, in our country, going, oh, Lord God, let people wake up. Our country has to get back to a place where we can have healthy conflict across both sides of the aisle. But the problem is, Nobody really wants to work out and study out and search out the truth. They want to feel good. They want to, you know, pretend like it's all fine. Never done that before? Pretend like something's fine? And then it just eats you away in the quiet? That's what's happening to our nation. No wonder depression is on the rise. No wonder mental health is on the rise. Because we're no longer teaching our young people how to have healthy conflict resolutions. How to guide their own hearts through the ups and the downs and the emotions to get to actual truth. But it's not new. This is how people have responded to truth for generations. It's nothing new. This kind of emotional reaction leads to violence. Keep, keep looking. Jump ahead to verse 7 in Acts chapter 17. So now, these Jews, understand these are Jews. These should be the people of God. They should, they should have a foundation in the word of God. If anybody would have received the Messiah. It should have been the Jews that were waiting for the Messiah. Okay, quick trivia question. Do the Jews of the, of the New Testament like Rome? We're confident in this. Okay, excellent. Notice that here in verses 6 and 7, the Jews who hate Rome, who speak against Rome, now go to Rome for help. What, to silence the truth, I'm going to compromise my other fundamental beliefs? Matter of fact, to compromise the truth, they even create a narrative. Taking a one part of the message, highlighting it and twisting it and presenting it, trying to now get the government to shut down the communication of truth. Look at this, it's in verse 6 and 7. It says, when they did not find them, because they went, they attacked the house of Jason looking for Paul and Silas. It says they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them. And these are acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Pause. If you're a Jew, you hate the decrees of Caesar. You're pretending now like you're super honorable to Caesar when you're really not. They are saying, there is another king, Jesus. Now, were the disciples saying that there is another king named Jesus? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. That, that is true. Were the disciples teaching that you need to serve Jesus and overthrow Rome? They were not. They were not saying overthrow Rome. The disciples are saying, serve Jesus as king of your heart and honor the government, government of the land. Everywhere that Christianity has thrived, Christianity is taught to honor even evil rulers. Throughout world history, Christians have been in countries where the rulers have been evil, and yet we are taught to honor the authority of the land, to pray for the blessing of the nation in which we are in. 
Do you see how they just took one little part of the message and they twisted it without hearing the whole message? This is one way to silence truth, when you only highlight part of the argument, or you get into these detailed on one word. Ever get caught up on one word rather than hearing the heart of the argument? That's what the people of Thessalonica did. That's what the Jews of Thessalonica did. Verse 8, and they troubled the crowds and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. I'm telling you, what happened in Thessalonica sounds a whole lot like cancel culture today. Cancel culture will grip onto one word and twist it. Will share a narrative and refuse to have communication to actually find truth. Where emotions are king. Proverbs 15.5 says this, A fool despises his father's instructions, but he receives correction as prudent. You see, how we as individuals respond to correction matters. How a culture responds to correction matters. I'm just going to ask a base question. How does the American, general American culture respond to being corrected? Like a toddler. Well, but I want it. Sorry, America. I'm just watching this happen. I'm going, wow, grow up. Become mature again and understand emotions are not king. But there is a subcurrent in humanity that wants emotion to be king. It has always been there. That has said, don't you dare correct me. You see, that's our pride. Pride keeps me uncorrectable. But again, this isn't just the world outside. This can become us as Christians. God can come to you and say, hey, I'm calling you to a new level. And our pride says, oh, I don't want to do that, God. God, that'll be a little hard. That'll be a little uncomfortable. Lord, mm, mm, ah, mm. Ever, ever him and haw with God? I've him and hawed with God. I don't know why. I should just give up now and obey, but I wrestle and I struggle, and he lovingly corrects and guides me to the point where I humble myself, and then it's good again, and the process repeats. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this is never going to stop. God corrects you because he loves you. This is what Hebrews 12 says. He corrects and he disciplines his legitimate children. Why? Because he has a future for them. Again, this is what we do as parents. We correct our children so that they become successful adults. Not because we hate them. Because we want them to succeed. And eventually move out. But the world hates this. The world hates to be corrected. But we need to be careful that we don't point at the world and say, yeah, world, you don't like to be corrected without pointing a finger at our own lives and say, do I receive correction well from the Holy Spirit? Do I receive correction well as God is guiding me to greater and greater levels of holiness and righteousness and commitment to him? These are the things we must be aware of. Um, there's a book that Barnett put out. It's called Barnett Trends 2018. I absolutely love studying cultural trends, and Barnett does an amazing job at it. In this book, there is an article called The Rise of Tribalism. And it's talking about the effects of the Internet and globalization on the next generation. It used to be hundreds of years ago, if you had an opinion, you went to the people in your town and you shared your opinion. If the people in your town thought your opinion was stupid... They would say, that's a dumb opinion. You should really change that. They would put pressure on opinions. And that person would look around and go, man, maybe I should. Maybe I should reconsider. But now there's this thing called globalization that's happening where you can go online right now and find a group of people to agree with you on anything. On anything. Any topic, any subject, there are groups out there. And what happens is people will find one other person to affirm a feeling. I feel like this is true. I feel like it's true. Awesome. And they become what Barnett calls an emotional tribe. Where now the goal of the tribe is no longer to grow and mature and find truth. The goal of the tribe is now to protect your other tribal members' emotions. And this is why studies are showing that facts are moving people less and less, especially American young people. Emotions seem to rule the day. Where emotions trump facts. It's happening. And one of the quotes from this article says, primarily it causes people to, to believe that whatever their group believes, regardless of external evidence or, or opinion, to the contrary. So this effects of globalization has caused all these pockets in society to group around each other and become immovable in their belief. And when we become immovable in our beliefs, it brings division among humanity. And there's more division 
I believe, in our nation now than there has ever been in my entire life. And it's because of this. Because people no longer actually want to find truth and work things out. They want to protect their emotions. I don't know how many of you have enjoyed the plethora of political ads. Um, I've loved my personal text messages from both presidential candidates. That's nice. They know me. It's wonderful. First name basis. Hey, Casey. Hey. But a lot of the promoting is emotional. It's, 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 it's a narrative to get you to feel a certain way because they understand culture wants to follow emotion. We must be wiser. And we must be able to communicate better. We must be people that receive correction and don't allow our emotions to cause us to shut down truth like the people of Thessalonica. But you know, there are other people in this world that are different than the people of Thessalonica. And that's the second response we see. And that is the response of the Jews from Berea. We have to understand, both of these groups, their foundation, their culture should have been very similar. They were Jews living in foreign cities. But something was different about the Jews of Berea. Something was different when Paul showed up, as was his custom, and began to teach the good news. They didn't just want to shut it down. It was uncomfortable, trust me. What? The Messiah came and I missed it? What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's all my granddaddy taught me. That's all my great, great granddad believed. I don't know about all this. It was uncomfortable to hear something new. But look at how the disciples or the Jews in Berea responded. Acts 17, verse 10. It says, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness. And I love this. And they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now hear me. We are not called as the people of God to just accept everything we hear. There's a lot of weird doctrine out there. I've been taught since the time that I was a child, pastors are human beings doing a divine job and sometimes we don't communicate the best. I may use a word that I think I know what it means, but in your head it means something else. Has that ever happened? No? Okay, cool. It's called communication. Communication is hard. And so when things are being communicated, even from the pulpit, my challenge to you is this, search it out. Hey, if the Holy Spirit is bringing conviction on you, search out. Go deeper. What happens on a Sunday morning or in a podcast or in a message is not enough for our spiritual development. It's supposed to spur us on to do our own research, our own study, our own praying, our own pressing in. And all of a sudden what happens is we begin to grow individually, which if we all grow individually, we grow in maturity as a church. So what am I saying? Am I saying never trust me? Well, no. I hope you trust me a little bit. But I'm also saying I'm human and I'm fallible and I'm in growing and I'm learning. I am not yet perfected. I do not have perfect theology yet. One day, I think when I'm 85, I'll get there. I'm just not there yet. Give me some time. So as we grow, as the Lord is convicting, understand if God begins to put something on your heart, you have a responsibility to research it out, to lean into the things of God. Lord, why am I feeling this conviction? Lord, why am I feeling I need to give this thing up? Or why am I feeling I need to add this thing to my life? I didn't feel it a month ago, two months ago, a year ago. Because you're growing. God's taking you from where you are to where you need to be. Any grandparents in here tell me this still happens past the age of 65? Anybody? A couple like, yeah, I've talked to them. I'm like, it never ends. They're like, no. It just kind of like refines differently. <laughs> But I'm so impressed by the Jews of Berea. They heard this and something about it. It was uncomfortable. Oh, how do I know it's uncomfortable? They didn't jump right on it. But they didn't try to silence the truth either. What they did is, hey, let's search it out. He says the scripture says this. Give me the scroll of Isaiah, buddy. Did Isaiah say this? Hey, he says that this was prophesied. Was it prophesied? How did you read this? What did your granddad say about this scripture? Hmm, these things seem to line up. They searched daily. To find out whether these things are so. Verse 12, therefore, many, say many, many believed. Why? Because rather than resisting the truth, they leaned into the truth. They had conversations about the truth. Sometimes, as a Christian, one of the fears is that we'll be asked a question we don't know, or we will be brought into a debate that we're not ready to handle. 
That happens to me quite often when I'm sharing the gospel with someone or they find out that I'm a pastor. They will bring up one of the most controversial subjects in the world that they are well prepared to argue. And I feel no pressure to win that argument. I don't need to win the argument. I need to plant a seed in their life. I need to water seeds in their life. And I need to bless them. I don't engage in argument. Now, if someone is genuinely seeking truth, I will have conversation. And I will show proofs and evidences. But to somebody who just wants to rail against the truth, I, 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 don't, I don't step into that arena. Why? Because it has no profit. Be careful what you get involved in, especially online. There's a lot of non-profitable arguments happening out there. People have no interest in changing and growing, just trying to stir up drama. We don't need to engage in that, but we do need to be ready with an answer for the hope that we have when we're asked. Do you see this? Therefore, many believed, and also not a few Greeks, and prominent women as well. This is what happens when we begin to lean into truth, when we don't let our emotions guide us. Proverbs 6.23 says this, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs, are, sorry, reproofs of instructions are the way of life. If a commandment is like a lamp, I want you to imagine you're in a dark room. You need to see, so someone turns on a lamp. What's the first thing you do? Ah, oh, bright, what, the, why? Duh. Ever, ever, your kids ever do that to you? Morning, mom. <laughs> it takes us as humanity a while for our eyes to adjust. Our initial reaction is turn the light off, get it, cover it. That's humanity's natural response to light and to truth. They don't like it. It's offensive at first, but all of a sudden what happens as you begin to let your eyes adjust? All of a sudden you begin to look at what the light is illuminating, not at the light itself. That can hurt, right? You don't look right into a flashlight. But all of a sudden now you're looking at what the light is illuminating and you begin to learn more. You have to lean in, allow your, again, your eyes to adjust so you can see what the light's trying to show you. But if you always get mad at the light and you shut the light off instantly, that process will never happen. The commandment is a lamp. Boom, a command. Boom, I'm calling you to greater levels of holiness. Boom, I'm calling you to greater measures of prayer. Boom, I'm asking you to sacrifice something new. Boom, I'm asking you to step into something. Oh, it's bright. God, I don't want to. That's hard. That's not how I've set up my life. It's, uh. But as you begin to then lean in, your mind adjusts and you begin to see what God's trying to show you through the change. Wow, if I added this to my life, if I grew in that area, if I overcame this thing, I could do even more. Wow, Lord, thank you for turning that light on, even though it may have hurt me in the beginning. His commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. As a Christian, we're never going to get out of the call of God to be corrected by him. He sees the end from the beginning. We don't. So he may say, stop, go left, turn around, two steps back, pause, pause. I hate the pauses. Pause. Why? He's, he's guiding something that we can't see, but if we trust in him. And the more we obey him, the longer this goes on, the quicker we are to trust and to believe in him. Look at what Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 3 says. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the past of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. The people of Thessalonica were being scornful. They were letting anger rule their decisions. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. The Jews of Berea were meditating on the word. They were searching this out. Is this real? If it's real, I want it. If it's not real, I don't. But I'm going to find out one way or the other. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season whose leaf shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. This word meditate in the Old Testament, it, uh, uh, TV has stolen meditation and, and, and I think most Americans are familiar with Eastern meditation which is, you know, the whole om, right? Eastern meditation says to empty your mind. Focus on your breathing, on the Emptiness of the universe and emptying of the mind. That is a demonic twist of what real meditation is supposed to be. 
meditation, biblical meditation, is to intentionally fill your mind. To intentionally chew on things. One pastor said it actually means talking to yourself and mumbling. Didn't realize I was that good at that. (laughs) Working things out. Meditation is having conversations with others. Meditation may be reading a book to get more understanding. Meditation may be going to coffee with your pastor and asking him fun questions. I love it. Not because I have all the answers, mind you. Sometimes the answer is, that's a great question. Let's, let's work on that together. Let's grow together. Let me call some men that have gone further than me and ask them their journey and understanding of these things. Is that okay that we don't have to know everything? But when we meditate on the word, when we meditate on truth, there's a different change. So look at the side-by-side comparison. Side-by-side, two different responses. One is the response of of Thessalonica. The other is the response of Berea. Hear me, they both heard the word. They were both Jews taught from the time they were children to expect the coming of the Messiah. They were both Jews living in a harsh foreign land. And they heard the word. They heard truth. But at Thessalonica, they chose to be ruled by their emotions. When they saw the Greeks responding, they were moved with envy. Not in a desire for truth. It was completely selfishly motivated. I am now uncomfortable that you are sharing my precious doctrine with the Greeks. How dare you invite them into the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Do you hear the pride in that? They used violence to silence the truth. They got a mob together, attacked Jason's house, drug him. They created false narratives. And because of that response to truth, look, few believed. Few believed, it says. Few of those Jews believed. Many of the Greeks did, but few of those Jews believed. However, in Berea, we see that again they heard the word. And they sought out the truth. The word truth is missing from there, I'll be honest. I just realized it says sought out that, but oops, should say sought out the truth. See, not perfect. Is that okay? But then they let the truth change them. In the process of seeking out, they said, this is true. And if this is true, I want it. But understand, that caused them to change. Caused them to change some of their customs, some of their habits. It caused them to think a different way. Oh, how many of you love it when your phone doesn't update and they move your favorite buttons around? It's horrible! Why, phone developers, would you do such a thing? You're causing me to think in a different way, and that's what God was doing. It was an update to their theology. But they allowed it to change him, and because they responded to truth that way, the result is that many, many believe. But this process is not new. The response of the Thessalonica, the response of Berea has continued throughout the history of mankind. And it's going to continue into our grandkids and our great-grandkids' generation. They're going to be faced with truth. And they will respond to it in a way to try to silence the truth, letting their emotions be a false shield. Or they will learn to seek out the truth and define the truth. My prayer is that he would value truth. My prayer is that we would be people that search things out. An ignorant populace can be used to do great evil. If you don't know what's going on politically, there's some amazing resources. You need to know what's going on. Again, if you're not registered to vote, get out there. Get registered to vote. Because every non-vote is a vote for what you do not believe in. You want a further conversation? I love coffee. Only if it tastes like ice cream. But let's talk. Let's research. Let's have discussion. Let's look at the actual truth of things. But don't ignore it because it's difficult or uncomfortable. The church is still one of the greatest powers in this nation. If we will galvanize together, we can see a turn in our nation. But hear me. Not just politically, spiritually, the church is still the greatest power in this nation. We have the ability to pray down the kingdom of heaven on our communities and our families and our schools. So my concluding question is this. How am I responding to the things God 
is revealing to me. Again, it's real easy for us to point at them and say, yeah, you guys, yeah, you stop all that emotional response. Stop that silencing of the truth, you guys. But as I was reading this, the Lord was saying, how are you doing, Casey? How are you doing in what I'm trying to work in you? Are you responding through your emotions? Are you letting your pride keep you from actually leaning in to what I'm saying because you know that I might be asking you to do something hard? Because you know that where I'm taking you, it might not be the most comfortable spot, but it's the spot that's going to give me the most glory. So this week I've been like, oh God, I've just been thinking, how am I responding to the little promptings of the Holy Spirit? I was in my car, I was driving on Thursday, and I felt a prompt, you really need to call this guy. I was like, I don't want to call that guy. I don't know what's going on. I don't know the details. There's a, a guy I know from another state I haven't talked to. You know, it's like, God, I haven't talked to him in like two years. It's embarrassing. I don't just want to call up and say, hey. And I wrestled with God for 15 minutes on the highway. You need to come. Like, I don't want to. It's awkward. I'm so glad that God's gracious with me. And in his love, he prompted me. And it was a good thing. It was a connection. It was a divinely inspired encouragement. That's just a phone call. What about the other things God is working in you? How are you responding? How is your response to truth? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? This is not a salvation issue unless you're not saved and you need to respond to the truth of Jesus Christ, in which case, come on, he loves you. For most of us, this is a maturity conversation as we grow and we mature in the things of God. Father, how are we responding? How are we doing, dealing with the truth? How are we growing, O oh God? Lord, is there any area that I've been resistant to you in? Have I let pride or emotions keep me from doing the hard thing? Lord, is there more understanding that I need? Lord, I just pray, mature us as your people. Lord, I pray that you would correct us with your loving hand. God, I pray that you would pursue us, you would overtake us, that your goodness, O oh God, would overtake everyone here. Guide us, correct us, mature us, take us from where we are, God, to where we need to be. In every area of our lives, in our families, in our marriages, in our work, in our community, oh God, do this, I pray. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Jellyfish are still there, good. This week is VBS. Much truth is going to be communicated from this house this week to a generation that desperately needs to hear it. And to families, we don't know the details. We don't know where these kids are. But hear me, VBS is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. Because when truth is communicated to children, the seeds get planted deep. So before I call my wife up to, to dismiss this. Can we just pray for VBS this week? Would you join me? Father, I just ask for your grace. Father, your divine help to do that which we cannot do, to reveal truth to a young generation, to encourage young people who already know you. Father, do this, I pray here. May truth reign. And may people come to know you. May children put their faith in you. May families be impacted because a church came together and they put fish on the wall. Why? Because you love them, Jesus. Lord, I do pray, let every kid know that above all, that you love them. May every family be reminded of how much you love kids. Help us, O oh God, to be excellent in the communication. And Lord, I just pray, especially for that kid right now that's going through it. This has been a hard season for them. The kid that is hurting. The kid that is confused. Father God, I pray, especially for that young man or that young woman, as they come in here, that the peace of God would pass, surpass all their understanding that your joy would surround them, Lord, that you would free them from depression and anxiety, things that children should never be facing, oh God, I pray a freedom over them. Lord, do it today. Lord, I pray a special blessing over all the volunteers. As we come, may we be so full of the Holy Spirit and so full of joy. Lord, have your way in this VBS. We give you praise and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep praying for VBS. Love, will you come bless everyone out? Amen.
I always get choked up praying for stuff like that because even though I'm a pastor's kid and I was raised in the church, I still remember VBS. I still remember the, the adults that took the time. It goes a long way. It matters. It makes a difference. I don't remember their names, and I'm pretty good with names, but I remember their faces, and I remember that they loved big, and they loved well, and they looked a lot like Jesus because Jesus loves kids. So thank you. Thank you, guys. It's going to make a difference. And the kingdom of heaven will be so much larger and so much more joyful because of what happens this coming week. We have a couple of other opportunities we want to remind you of just before you leave today that are coming up. Mark your calendars for August 24th. We're going to be handing out some some little uh, promos as our kids and our families leave from VBS this week, telling them about another opportunity to to hear the love of Jesus. We're having a block party and we're partnering with a couple of other churches in our community and it's the Jesus Love Kids block party. It's at the Howard Commons on August 24th from 11 to 2. Families are invited. There's some fun activities planned for kids. I think there's haircuts and back to school things being given away. We just want to shower the communities in this area with the love of God. So maybe they won't come into church. Maybe they won't come to VBS but maybe they'll go and get a free haircut for their kid. And in that divine appointment, find out how much God loves them. So we encourage you to be involved. If you want to volunteer, there are volunteer opportunities, but if you don't want to volunteer, just come, come and be a part with us. We also have back to school Sunday coming up. Yay, the parents say the kids are going back to school. Boo, the kids say we're going back to school. But back to school Sunday on August 25th, bring your kids, bring your grandkids. We want to ask all of our children the college kids even, anybody going back to school, they're going to come up and as a church, we are going to bless them. We are going to lay our hands on them. We are going to speak God's protection and his faithfulness and his goodness over them and their minds and their bodies and their souls. And we are going to bless them because as a church, we have a blessing to give. It's one of the greatest things that we can do for our kids. And I know that we've talked a lot about kids and I'm so thankful that we're a part of a church that loves children and the next generation And if you are not a child or you don't have a child, I want to let you know we see you too. There are classes that we are planning for the fall for anybody who is not a kid. We have some adult things prepared for the various stages of life. So keep your ears leaned in. We do see you. We do hear you. We want to prepare things for you to grow in your walk with the Lord's as well. So just keep your ears tuned into that. And with that, I bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and protect you and shine his face upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace throughout your day. Stand up, greet one another, stay in fellowship with us. We are going to continue to decorate for VBS, but don't let that rush you out. Bless you. storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes are open There's nothing that I can't get to. It's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that I can't do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside. one word and you revive every dream 